<laughs> well, welcome back to the channel, everybody. I'm Dino, and it is an absolutely chilly day here in Niagara Falls, Ontario. It's about minus 11 out today. It's the middle of February, and you're probably hearing a little bit of hiss in the background. I've got the propane heater and all my electric heaters running today trying to bring the temperature up. Now, it's not that bad a day though, because today we're gonna take our fully serviced DR650 rear shock and reinstall it into the motorcycle, something I've been wanting to do for a couple weeks. Now, my buddy Carl says he's gonna stop by and give me a hand, and I'm really happy about that because I have a feeling it's gonna be much easier to do this with two people than one because I think I'm gonna to have to sort of manipulate the rear wheel to get all the bolts in right. So why don't you sit back, grab yourself something warm to drink on this cold, chilly day, and enjoy Dino's Tinker Shed. I'm really looking forward to this one. I hope you are too. You may be asking yourself, if I had this shock out of this bike and I had it in for service, why didn't I take the opportunity to upgrade the valving in the bike? There's a few reasons why I didn't do that. The first is, I actually don't mind the factory ride on the DR650 for the style of riding that I do. And I've said this before is, I'm not really an aggressive rider. Um, most of my riding is either on hard tarmac or it's gravel roads or fire roads, those types of things. I don't really get into a lot of aggressive riding or jumping the bike or anything like that. So the stock valve stack in it seems to work pretty good for my style of riding. And the fact that, you know, upgrading the shock can be hundreds of dollars in revalving and you may end up with something that is actually harsher than you want it to be. It was a pretty easy decision for me to stick with the stock valving, especially since everything looked like it was in really good shape when Oliver took it apart and inspected it. The other reason is I haven't done anything to the front end either. It's pretty much just a stock front end with the damping rod technology that it always comes with. Um, it does appear that it has a bit of a heavier fork spring in it to match the heavier fork spring or shock spring on the back. But overall, again, the ride compliance of the bike was pretty good for my style of riding. Now that's not to say that I may not uh, upgrade this at another time when I have a little bit of extra cash or I really kind of interested in, in sort of experimenting, but for the time being, I'm pretty satisfied with the way the stock bike rides. And I'm curious to see how it's gonna ride now that the shock and the forks have both been serviced with fresh oil and uh, all greased and cleaned up. So that's the reason why I just basically stuck with the stock valving. Before I actually put the spring and shock assembly back into the DR650 here, I want to take the time and roughly set the actual spring length itself on the actual shock tube. If you remember back to the servicing video, Oliver right away picked out the fact that I have an aftermarket spring on my shock assembly. And I know that's true because it says Ebok on the side of it, even though I can't find what the weight rating is for that. But also I can compare that to my friend Carl's DR650 that actually has a stock spring on it. So I know it's got heavier coils in it. Oliver also mentioned the fact and stressed the fact that your ride height is set by the preload on the spring. It's not set by the shock itself. The shock dampens your spring rate. It doesn't set your ride height. So he was very, very particular about measuring the preload that was on the shock when it came in. Now that preload was two inches of exposed threading on the actual shock tube. If you measured from the start of the threads all the way to the top of the adjustment ring. 
And that's where I have it today. But I also wanted to measure the total length of the spring itself when it has that two inches of preload on it. And what I measured was around 258 millimeters of actual spring length. If I was to compare that to the manual, the manual actually gives you spring lengths depending on uh, what type of ride you want, whether you want soft, medium, or firm ride. But you have to be aware that that is set with a stock spring. And with a stock spring, the softest set setting is actually around 253 millimeters. I think it actually has 253.5 in the climber's manual. So you can see that my spring is already longer than the softest preload that the manual recommends. If I was to use the stiffest spring preload that's recommended, that's around a length of 238.5 millimeters, so about 20 millimeters shorter than the spring length that I have now. The bike rode quite well with the way it was set up last season, so what I'm going to do is I'll install it with the 258 millimeter spring length. I'll put it back in, I'll set the bike back down onto the ground, and then I'll measure what they call sag. Sag is an interesting topic, and it can become a bit of a rabbit hole as you start reading about it. If you go on to DR Riders and start reading some of the posts on SAG, you'll realize that there's some generalities, but then there's some super specific stuff that depends on the style of riding that you do and sort of your preferences for the way the bike is going to ride and handle. To try and simplify this, I'm just going to talk about the rear end because that's the shock that we're putting back in and try to explain how I'm going to set this. Now, with the bike sitting up on the stand the way it is, the swing arm is fully extended as far as it can go. It's not touching the ground. I know from reading the manual and reading posts online that the DR650's rear suspension has a total of 10.2 inches of travel, available travel to it. So that's basically how far the axle can move upward towards the top of the bike before it bottoms out. So we have 10.2 inches of available travel to us at any given time. Most people suggest that when you lower the bike onto the ground and then sit on it, the bike should compress about one third of that available travel. And we do this so that when you're going over bumps, the wheel can actually drop down into voids and come back up without the whole bike itself falling into the hole. That's why you have SAG. It allows the rear wheel to track the ground and give you traction and stop some of the pogoing effect. So what we do is we measure between the rear axle and a fixed point somewhere up on the top of the motorcycle. And then when we lower it to the ground, we're gonna sit on the bike and measure that distance again to that same fixed point. We should look for about 3.4 inches of sag when I sit on the motorcycle with my weight. And it should really include all of my riding gear, but. I don't tend to get that fussy because I'm not that aggressive of a rider. Um, but we measure that distance from the axle of the fixed point again and look for about 3.4 inches of difference. So let's do that now. It might be a little easier to show you than talk about it because I'll tell you, it is a bit of a complex issue. I'm also going to adjust my compression damping as a baseline to eight clicks out from full hard. So I'm going to turn it all the way in until it just gently sets down on the hardest setting and then I'm going to back it out eight turns and that's where the factory says to start your adjustments. Oliver was also very keen on me trying different settings throughout the year to see what I like. So I'll do a video on that as well and tell you how well this compression damping actually works on this factory shock. Now I'm sure you could do this job by yourself, but having a buddy like my friend Carl here help is really, really beneficial. 
he basically just lowers the shock in from the top and then I help align the top bolt hole with a drift here. It sounds really simple, but we actually had a little bit of a difficult time. Can you lift it up a little bit? Ugh. Pry on that or? Yeah, you probably get it over here. Yeah? Hmm. Uh, still looks like it's not quite centered, but I don't think it's turning with the... Yeah, with the little bar in there. Yeah. Now eventually we did get the top bolt in, we torqued this down to uh, 40 foot-pounds, and then we proceeded to deal with the lower shock bolt. Okay. When you go to tighten that lower shock bolt, there's something you need to be aware of. The factory says that that bolt should be torqued to 40 foot-pounds. Now, if you read the climber's manual, and there's even notes in the shop manual itself from Suzuki, tightening that bolt to 40 foot-pounds does run the risk of pulling the threads out on that lower shackle on the bottom of the shock assembly itself. What climbers recommends is to use a little bit of blue medium strength thread locker just to make sure that the bolt doesn't come out and then tighten it down to around 30 to 35 foot-pounds of torque. The thread locker will keep the bolt in place and it won't vibrate out. The problem for me is 35 foot-pounds of torque runs right in between both my 3 8 and half-inch drive torque wrench. I don't really have the ability to torque it to factory spec. So what I did is I ran it up to around 25 foot-pounds with my 3 8 drive ratchet or 3 8 drive torque wrench and then just used a 3 8 drive ratchet to give it just a little bit more to bring it up to around 30 to 35 foot-pounds. It's a little bit of a pain, but it is sort of protecting the fact that those threads are a little bit fragile being that they are aluminum. I'm first going to place a piece of green painter's tape on my tool tube here and make a nice clear sharpie mark on that. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to lift the back of the motorcycle to fully extend the shock. Carl's then going to take a measurement from the bottom of the axle tube up to that mark and it turns out to be about 20 and a half inches but it could be anything depending on where you put your mark. I'll record this up onto the actual whiteboard here for comparison later. And then Carl's going to take a second measurement with just the weight of the bike on it. And now with me sitting on it. It's me. Oh, oh, she's me. Oh, oh, she's me. Oh, oh, she's sorry, buddy. Did I? No, I walk into it there. Okay. That's, no, defi no. That, hey, that's definitely on phone. Oh, hey, man. <laughs> With Carl recovered, he takes the final measurement with me actually sitting on the bike. And then we record this on the whiteboard. Okay, so our initial measurements were the bike without any weight on it, 20.5 inches of sag. The bike alone, 18.5 inches. And then when I parked my butt on it, it drooped down to 16.5 inches. So I could afford to actually compress and put a little more preload on the spring to get me to that 3.5 to 3.3 quarters sag length. So let's put a little bit more preload on the spring. So to tighten it, I'm just gonna grab and spin the whole unit like this. And you can see it's tightening down slowly away from that top spanner ring there. So I'll give it, I don't know, a half a dozen turns and then I'll move this one down as well. Adjusting the spanner rings on the actual shock assembly itself to either increase or decrease preload is usually done with one of these, a spanner wrench. Now I thought with the air box out I'd be able to use just a standard one like this. But unfortunately there's just still not enough room to actually use an adjustable tool like this. What I need is sort of a one piece unit that's simply this, this mobile piece here. It doesn't have the handle on it. And then you attach this to your ratchet and it'll give you a little bit more purchase on it than I have with this one. Now I own one of these. Unfortunately, 
it's in my toolkit for my snowmobile and my buddy Mark is actually using my snowmobile this weekend so him and his wife can go for a ride so I don't have access to it. The next best thing is really to use a drift, not a coal chisel. Now mine's been attacked by a coal chisel already and you can see that in these pictures here. A coal chisel can actually take the, the little nubs right off the spanner ring. So instead, I used a drift like this, which has a square end on it and just gently radius sides. Now I reach in there and you can tap this with a hammer and spin the ring around. Now this is not my preferred way to do things, but in a pinch this does work and there's really not as much room in there even with the air box out then i expected to adjust those spanner rings so i ended up having to use one of these but i would have preferred to use the tool that i just don't have today All right, so after adjusting the spanner rings, we actually brought the sag to 16 and three quarter inches. So that gives us three and three quarter inches of sag, which I think is pretty good for my riding style. It'll be nice and plush and cushion. I think it's very similar to what I had before. So I'm gonna stop there for now, especially with that heavier spring that I have in my bike. One of the areas that two people actually helped more than I really thought it would was putting the air box back into the bike. With four hands, you can actually move all the wires around easily and the other person can kind of manipulate this air box back in. Now the first step to this, of course, is putting the bellows back in and when we did this, we forgot to put the clamp the first time, so make sure you do that. But even once we got the airbox back into the general location, one of the things we found challenging was actually getting that large bellows opening back onto the airbox body. What we found helped a lot was to take the air filter right out of the box and that way you could get your hands inside the bellows and kind of massage that back up and onto the outside of the airbox body. The same thing was true with the snorkel. We were able to insert the snorkel from the top and then reach into the air box and kind of pull it down into place. I have a feeling in the summer when it's about 30 degrees Celsius, it would be a lot easier to get that snorkel back in. But today, again, it's about minus 11 out. It's maybe, maybe plus five or plus six in the shop here right now. It's a little challenging to get that thing on, but you know what? I know you can do it. With the snorkel in place, we finalized by tightening up both the clamp to the bellows and the clamp that attaches to the carburetor itself, and then follow this up by putting all the bolts back in and securing them so the air box is tight again. Last up is just to reassemble the air filter, put back on the side panels, and finally the bike is ready to ride again. Well, that feels really good. I'm pleased. I think all that service on the suspension bearings and, of course, the shock itself is really going to pay off for this upcoming riding season. And I can't wait to get out and ride. It's actually snowing today. It's about minus five out. But another four or five weeks, and I might be able to sneak out and get some tuning in on the rear suspension and play a little bit with that compression dampening adjustment that Oliver talked about. Overall, this is a really easy project to do. It just takes some time and it really helps if a good buddy like my friend Carl comes over and gives you a hand, especially on the reassembly portion where I had to lift the rear wheel up a little bit to actually get the bolts to line up. But overall, it really is just a matter of taking your time, keeping track of all your fasteners, and then reversing and putting everything back in the same way you took it out. So I know that you can do it if I can. Until then, I'm gonna get things a little bit more put back together here in the shop, clean the bike a little bit more, but I hope to see you soon here on Dino's Tinker Shed. You have yourself a great day.